Well, last week we started a rather interesting outline of the development of the internal spiritual resources of the human being. We carried it to various levels, so we want to continue today to go a little further. We started in by Gauss covering the idea of uh, knowledge and uh, carrying it on to wisdom. And today we're going a little further. We're going to carry it on to uh, a higher level of spiritual maturity under the heading of understanding. Actually, if we look back to our most remote ancestors that lived in caves or swamps, the Piltdown Man or the Pithecanthropus Erectus, we find that the little intellect that was available at that time was used largely to protect the physical life of the individual. <clears throat> they had very little uh, area of intelligence but they were struggling to survive. And all intelligence was devoted to survival, physical survival. Now time has passed. We've become much more sophisticated. We have much greater area of interest. But still, for most people, mind is used to protect survival. We are still concerned mostly with the mind doing the things which we want to accomplish. We want the mind to be educated and support us. We want the mind to make us happy. We want it to give us the pleasures and advantages of life. We want it to take the education we have prepared for it. And the mind in its usages is to make us more physically secure, comfortable, wealthy, and more or less so unhappy on the grounds that these things are burdens upon the spirit. So we have the mind beginning its existence as, a, as an instrument of the survival of physical things. <clears throat> now it's become much more sophisticated, but for the most part it is still serving most people in terms of making life more comfortable. Very few people think of mind as more than a commodity. It is a means of accomplishing something. No one really cares much what it is of itself or questions what it might do if we used it differently. But back in the more classical periods, it dawned upon some folks that the mind was more than merely a servant of survival. The mind was a means of accomplishing all kinds of specialized activities. The mind made the musician and the philosopher and the architect, the statesman and the doctor and all the different people who developed specialized intelligence were working with the mind. So we gain a little bit of an understanding and as the individual grew up, the mind grew up too and the mind gradually gained a larger sphere of influence. It was still an intellectual entity. It was still related to our physical needs, but it was also a means of extending and expanding ourselves into new areas of activity. As a result of that, the mind grew and gave us great cities. It gave us the Alexandrian libraries. It gave us the Acropolis of Athens in the pyramids of Egypt. It became the instrument for the expansion of the human state. It is no longer simply a matter of survival. It was qualifying survival, making it greater, making it more important and more significant. And so it went on and on. And uh, at all this time, it was developing certain specialized attributes. It was giving us the foundations of arts and sciences. It was giving us the beginnings of various changes in our own personalities. The uh, mind which originally helped us to survive now began to help us to unfold 
and we enrich our own potentials. We find genius of all kinds developing. We're finding individuals becoming poets and artists and musicians. We find the mind constantly now contributing to the unfoldment of the potential of the individual. There's one thing, however, that was consistent or more or less so. The mind was almost entirely used to fulfill some kind of physical purpose. All the arts and sciences were physical. They want to make better looking buildings and greater paintings. But it was for the sake of physical things. The mind also gave us armament to protect ourselves. It gave us laws for the development of social conditions. It variously enriched us, but always for the same basic purpose, pointed toward physical existence. Gradually, a few philosophers, as we mentioned in the idea last week, began to develop the idea of the mind having a, a different function, a greater and more important contribution to make. <clears throat> the mind was to extend the individual not only into the physical life of the time, but into the cultural life, and gradually into the internal religious life of the person. The religious life of the average human being is comparatively undeveloped even to the present time. But it is there, and it has all kinds of moral and ethical implications. It gives us great visions. It makes ways of peace and helps us to solve problems that would otherwise endanger our survival. So we develop a new branch of mentality, a branch of mentality coming closer and closer to the invisible causes of our visible existence. We began to think in terms of the wonders of the inner self. We began to recognize the possibility of genius, we also recognized that this mental faculty could attack unanswered questions relating to matters far beyond the physical life. It began to answer the questions about why and what and how. And in that we find it rising in the great Greek systems of philosophy where there were solutions to the great problems of life. Plato and Aristotle and Socrates gave us answers to moral problems, began to understand and help us to understand good and evil, right and wrong, hope and fear, and gave all types of information which would help us to fortify <coughs> our instincts against the pressures of the times. So we began to think in terms of philosophy. And philosophy began to change the world we lived in. It began to give us a glimpse of something beyond matter. It gave us a concept of a part of our nature that had not yet been fully developed. The uh, inner potential of the individual was not exhausted by the achievement of physical advantages. He might become able to create an atomic bomb but this did not completely exhaust the inner life of the person. He could also create a remedy for the bomb. We find all types of science developing ingenuities and research projects. Well, the research project was a challenge to the intellect. The research project was one in which individuals were striving to know more. For the most part, however, these research projects were also largely physical. They had to do with health problems. They had to do with international law and types of things of this kind. But there was now a gradual development and a separation of projects. For now we began to have the mind thinking in terms of religion, thinking in terms of ethics, thinking in terms of morality. And gradually from these thoughtfulnesses of the mind, we began to develop a civilization which was more than merely the perpetuation of our physical propensities. In order to accomplish this particular type of growth, it became also important to give more and more attention 
uh, to the study of things not normally or commonly understood or appreciated. So here we come down into the Middle Ages, into the great Florentine Renaissance and things of this nature. We find art flourishing. We find religion developing and scattering about the whole surface of the earth. We find the individual also beginning to think of other things. He began to think not just simply as they did in Egypt, that when the Pharaoh died, he went to the valleys and the plains of Amentat and remained there rejoicing forever. Or of the Chinese uh, emperor who took an, an army of life-size clay figures with him into the afterlife. There began to be a study of things like the afterlife. Now how was the mind to explore this subject? There was no real basis. He couldn't go, the mind couldn't go to some college or university and take a course. It was all struggling to find out from within himself what he could do as a person that influenced man in these matters. But little by little, exploration began to pay off. There began to be new things thought about, new answers to problems. And as we suppose in the you know, state of wisdom in the last talk, wisdom began to support certain conclusions of the mind. Wisdom began to recognize that it could make rules and to see the result of these rules. So gradually a, a body of knowledge developed as a result of testing, of trying, and of applying principles to problems. Little by little, as we went along this road, we began to de develop idealistic conceptions. Our remote ancestors believed that we went to sleep in the ground and maybe the shadow or ghost hovered around the village. We began to think of much more sophisticated answers to life after death. And among the Greeks and Egyptians, the problem of life after death became one of the basic of interests in connection with the development of the mind. Could the mind answer this question? Yes, the mind could answer the question. It could answer it in a way. But the answer was not final. The mind as we know it at the present time could not reach out to the ultimate of knowing. It could only go a certain distance. It could make, for instance, immortality seem reasonable, seem possible but it could, make, could not make it a fact beyond question or beyond doubt to common knowledge. So everywhere we find the mind gradually exploring fields which had been generally neglected. And in the exploring it began to develop rational solutions. And practically all of our intellectual life is derived from these rational solutions. The laws of governments are so derived. The beliefs of churches are so derived. Everything became a problem of accepting the reasonable, the probable, the possible, but there was no absolute certainty. This absolute certainty was beyond the capacity of the intellectual equipment as we knew it. So we went along and gradually built up a civilization, something like we have today, a hodgepodge of good and bad, of intelligence and ignorance, of right and wrong, of hope and fear. And over this peculiar conglomerate, the mind still sits in judgment. The mind tells us when we have broken the rule. Sometimes it tells us we have broken it when we haven't broken it. Because now the mind begins to be influenced. As soon as the mind was strong enough to make decisions, various individuals wish to use it to make decisions favorable to themselves, very often at the expense of someone else. So the mind gradually became infected, and mentality it was no longer trustworthy. The mind was no longer disciplined by something beyond the mind. And this brought another question into focus that is still being tossed about uh, by atheists and agnostics. Agnostic. Is there anything beyond the mind? Is there a higher power than the mind by, by which we may come to certainties the mind cannot attain? Here again, there was a problem of rationality. The mind itself was perfectly willing to admit that there might be something superior to itself. But what that was and how it functioned 
the mind was not certain. So we had a series of very good and basic conjectures. And on these most of our civilization is built. Our religions are built upon probabilities that have been considered and estimated. Also, they've been, religion has been built upon codes of conduct which have been proven to be useful. The, these codes of conduct are justified by their utility. But the possibility or probability of trying to prove them dogmatically remains uncertain. So gradually the mind got to a point where it went about as far as it could. And that far it went was wisdom. And wisdom was the possibility of taking speculations, opinions, and all that type of thing and subjecting them to some type of orderly discipline. The mind took certain common fallacies and cleared them away. But the mind could not reach into the very depth of the problem. The great questions, where do we come from, why are we here, and where are we going, still these are not answered by mind alone. Certainly the mind has answers, but very few people are satisfied with the intellectual approach to the ultimate questions of life. So we have this problem that there is a need of something else. And as we study man more carefully, we realize that that something else is available. There is something else. There is another power. There is something that can measure and estimate. There is a kind of understanding that is not purely intellectual. And in order to explain that and solve it, the mind itself creates an answer. And this answer is the human soul. There is a soul. There is a part of man that is superior to body, superior to physical consideration, superior to life and death as we know it on this planet or any other planet. There is something that is superior to the common judgment of humanity, something that is beyond our control and be more almost beyond our understanding. But there is something, and that something brings with it the first hint of immortality. It tells us something about a survival greater than merely even rebirth. For rebirth could be a continuing development of mental entities. But then we have a problem. Why this development? There has to be some reason for every thing that happens. And you do not have a continuing process of creation unless that creation is going somewhere or these continuations change sufficiently to result in a form of growth. So we have the emergence of something that we now call the soul. Now the soul was not unknown to the ancients. The soul was everywhere for everybody who wanted or believed that there was some part of himself that was superior to the mind. The, the, the world was filled with people who believed that there were values that were not limited to physical values. They were not simply barricaded behind walls of clay and mud. They were, because there was something that was divinely present. There was a life principle. And this life principle had some mysterious spiritual integrity. Therefore, the soul came into existence. And individuals used to say of each other, he was a good soul. And uh, then there was the, the term of soul as only, the, the soul recipient. Therefore, the soul began, began to develop as something beyond the mind, uh, something that was up above. And if there was something up above, there had to be an up above for it to develop in. So with the soul came the whole concept of religion as we know it now. Uh, came the entire conviction of a great universe of invisibles, of causes, of laws and principles, ruled over by benevolence, ruled over by justice, and ruled over by integrity dedicated to the fulfillment of the growth of creatures that the, the plan of things was not just worked out haphazardly, but that the plan had its ground in a great soul pattern, a pattern that was benign, a pattern that had its final purpose, the redemption of all that lives. So there was this concept, the earthly mind began to play with the idea. It began to question some of its own beliefs. 
and it gradually began to tolerate the idea that there was something beyond matter, something beyond physical existence, that the human soul was not completed here, that the human soul did not originate here, and that the entire concept of a completely materialistic creation was not adequate to explain the mystery of the human being. The more this was explored, the more it became obvious. Because when man began to think about the soul, or began to consider that there was something within himself, deeper than the body with which he was burdened in the physical life, as long as he believed in something more, he had to be an idealist. He could not be an atheist. He could not really be an agnostic. For the moment he believed that there was a law and order beyond physical things, he had to have a source for it. And the only source he had was a superior world which was capable of, re of controlling and dominating material existence. This also brought about the realization that the kings of earth, the pharaohs who went to sleep in their graves, all the material glory and uh, pomp and ceremony was not the real thing. It was not the ultimate. That this was only a part of physical life. That somewhere there had to be an upper half of creation. Wherever there was a material effect, there had to be a cause. And sometimes these causes could not be found in, ma in material things. So we had quite a struggle here for quite a time, trying to straighten out some of these ideas, and finally came to the conclusion that there was a half of the universe that we never saw, that we had seen only the lower half of a complete sphere, that the upper half was invisible and was known only by its consequences, that there was certain things that happened that could only happen if there was something in the invisible that had form and shape and authority. So instead of an empty space, we began to think of a space with a dimension of life that was invisible to us but was real. And we began to think of spiritual matters, now the mind working with the spiritual problem came to another series of decisions that it had to make. If there was a spiritual reality, if there was something in the human being that we might call spirit or something in existence that might be regarded as spiritual, then there were rules governing it. And from the experience of life, the rules of the spiritual realities were nobler, more beautiful and more exalted than the rules of body. The body had very great limitations, but in some mysterious way the soul had a much, a much larger sphere of activity. The soul also had value. The ancients that with the body simply assumed that it went down to the uh, grave. Sometimes a shadow or ghost lingered for a time, <clears throat> but the body had no enduring part in the mystery of human life. When it was cast off, that was the end. But the soul now began to bring in other thoughts. There was no proof when or where the soul was born, and no proof when or where it died. And the more it was studied, the more it was realized that it must have a considerably greater sphere of activity than the body. The soul being as it was a spiritual over-self also became gradually recognized as the proper ruler of mind and ruler of bodies. The soul dethroned the mind, particularly for the religious people. They found the soul was the proper guide and proper guardian of value. The mind could defeat us, destroy us. It could it variously misrepresent things. But the soul theoretically had to be above this. Now the soul also is capable it is according to the ancients, are making mistakes. But these mistakes were largely due to the perspective of the point of view rather than of the soul itself. There is very little evidence anywhere that the soul sins, yet it is referred to that the, the soul sinned. There is something very serious. But the soul doesn't sin. What really is that the individual has sinned in some lower part of his nature, and has allowed it to appear to be the soul. But that the soul is corrupted is doubtful, because that is an incorruptible thing. 
The one when corruption affects the inner life of the person, it is not his soul that is sickened by the corruption. It is his soul that becomes sad because of the corruption. Therefore, in every case, corruption cannot affect something superior to itself. And as corruption for the most part is physical and the soul is not, the soul cannot be touched in its substance. It can only be damaged in its manifestation. So began to, they began to think a lot about soul. And most of the great religions that we have today have been based upon a philosophy of soul. They recognize the existence in man of a part that survives the disintegration of the body. There were a few who began to think in terms of living forever in the body. But this did not seem especially practical. And even though it is interesting and startling as a theory, it never gained any great importance. The individual recognized the importance of change. And as the body grew old and decrepit, it was considered advisable to change it for a new organism. Therefore, there was a constant change of bodies. But were there also changes of souls? This became quite an interesting matter. Does every body have a new soul? Is every soul something that is created in an invisible life, but is part of the part of body? Is the soul something that is superior to body? Does it move into the body at birth? Does it depart from the body at death? Or does the soul have a continuing living existence in some other dimension of space? And the Christians and most of the other religionists finally came to the conclusion that the soul had an existence apart from body. That it came into body for a time and departed from body. That efforts to contaminate the soul actually did not do so. But that the body was contaminated and the mind was contaminated and the result was it appeared that the soul also was adversely conditioned. But the soul itself, as a factor in existence, was regarded as forever benevolent. Therefore, the ancients had a concept that they gradually developed of the perilous journey. The perilous journey was the tra value of the journey of the human being from the lowest form available for consideration on the physical plane through all the conditions that led ultimately to sainthood or the, de uh, the development of a deatific condition in the race of human beings. We have therefore the problem of this journey in which the person gradually grows up. He grows up from the fact of a physical existence in a stone cave where he made a few stand marks and symbols on walls of granite. It grows up through the mound builders, through the gradual tribes of people, the gradual rise of nations, until down to the present time. There was a continuing progression of uh, the uh, powers of the mind to condition something else. The mind was forming more noble mansions for the soul. Now, if the mind was contaminated, this damaged the entire pattern and therefore various methods of repentance and so forth were set up. But these set up were set up to take care of the derelictions of the mind, not virtues or vices of the soul. So we live today in a modern world in which we have a soul that is immortal. And we have a mind that can and may ultimately become much more immortalized than it is now. But we have a mind that is capable of serious errors, that is capable of contamination, that is capable of becoming hopelessly fascinated by inferior matters. The mind it can be and is often corrupted, but the soul it basically is not. The basic condition of the soul is either developing its own nature or waiting patiently for the ages to produce the qualities necessary for the manifestation of soul power. So out of this also then came a science, this crisscross science of between the mind and the soul, in which the mind gradually developed the powers to support the soul, and the soul was released to manifest more and more through the body. 
the ones in which the soul was released for more and fuller manifestation in body those people were called mystics they were persons who depended upon certain inner values which could not be supported by the intellect alone so we gradually developed not only divisions in all forms of knowledge but even in religion itself we have a religion therefore that does recognize the possibility that the soul can be contaminated but also that it can be purified the uh, modern religion actually thinks in terms of redeeming the soul by reforming the mind if the individual in its physical propensities carefully and diligently practices the virtues then he releases the soul from imprisonment in the cages and in the prisons of his false living this is partly has present in most oriental philosophies and much of the religions beliefs of antiquity in general namely that the soul was the victim of the mind therefore the soul had to be rescued and if the soul is rescued it becomes the instrument of immortality and gradually this is going on all the time it is going on every day every person in every walk of life is either building soul or, or limiting it the soul constitutes a, more, a more normal moral and ethical reality and uh, most of the great philosophers of Greece and so forth have bestowed upon the soul the attributes of the highest virtues they have said that the soul waited patiently for the mind to catch up to it waited patiently for the body to reform so that the soul could manifest to it therefore the soul gradually became recognized as the redeemer the savior the protector the regenerator of the body and the mind well it was important that the mind did have some kind of a control because it was pretty well out of control and we find today as we look forward to another century of progress that we have a body that is suffering from utter conflict within the body a conflict between what is right and what is immediate uh, what is the fulfillment of desire and what is the unfoldment of integrity and we find more and more people who are gradually giving up the fight and allowing themselves to fall into the confusion of negative attitudes and corrupted conduct so we do not know just how it's going to work out but one thing is evident that we are not building soul power to any great degree we are not giving the best of ourselves a chance we are not using the finest faculties that we have to protect ourselves we are compromising all of the higher faculties in order to cater to the lower ones now there is no question that, uh, that the individual is in desperate need of drugs or uh, tobacco or alcohol uh, but the individual who actually knows that these things will be a destructive force in his life still will not give them up for the reason that these things are tangible while virtues are intangible to most persons virtues are forms of frustration and the other in the end the individual will rather take a chance of dying of bad habits than of sacrificing the pleasures of the moment this calls for a reorganization of a lot of thinking and it also calls for a re-understanding of the const construction of the human being we know for instance that the human being has the capacity of disobedience it, now you know that the individual through ignorance can disobey there is no proof that intelligence will disobey because intelligence implies that the intelligence knows that no uh, fault can ever survive and that the that evil can never win but in the temporary gamut of things evil has a temporary success and many people are perfectly willing to settle for that we may very often hear among the narcotic victims where the individual admits that it'll probably be the destruction of him but then in the meantime he will have a few highs and in these highs he will think he runs the world and in that is a full payment for the fact that he has destroyed a few months later so they have this, two, this problem we have the physical person 
as he has been since the Stone Age, and we have this other something that has been gradually developing, Emerson's Oversoul. We have constantly developed an inner life that is higher than the outer expression of life. Now, everyone hasn't done this, but most of the lawmakers and those who have set up the codes of civilization have had some vision of the reality. Therefore, they have nearly always made a code that was somewhat in advance of prevailing customs. They have tried to give the individual a way of life which will challenge him to a slightly greater expression of his internal integrities. Therefore, we have progress in the codes of most peoples. But these progresses, as they have been denominated, are for the most part ignored. The individual is perfectly willing uh, in our way of life to compromise his eternal integrity for his temporal advantages. Now this is of course something we face in government, in politics, in science, in all of the arts and crafts. We find the individual who is perfectly willing to pay for the privilege of doing wrong. And there is always an individual who is glad to do wrong to be well paid. We have therefore a very serious problem in which the willpower within the person is not strong enough to take care of the, of the temptations of society. Well, we've been here a long time. We've seen a lot of nations rise and fall. We have, are seeing today the worst chaos the civilization has ever passed through. We see that most of our institutions have been corrupted and that those are not, that are not corrupted are out of date. We constantly recognize that things are wrong, but we do not want to dynamically do anything about it. So, we keep on going, giving the mind and the uh, various uh, uh, habits of the body control, and at the same time, suffer the consequences of disobeying the rules of life. Now, how did we find out about those rules of life? How do we know, for example, that we should not follow certain other policies that are now popular? Well, the mind can give us the answer if we want it, but we have reconditioned the mind and have forbidden it to tell the truth. It has to agree with what we want, and we will not accept any less. As far as the soul is concerned, it is pretty much in silence. It has not had the opportunity to express itself. It means that also that if we want to make any major change of importance to society, we have got to change the relationships of these inner elements of our own personalities. If we want a better world, we must accomplish the personal victory of soul power over brute force. We must achieve the victory of, of intelligence over ignorance and uh, virtue over vice. And this victory must be a more or less personal victory. We are all hoping that someone is going to make a great ado uh, about this problem and there's going to be a great wave of redemption. There is no evidence of it, however, at the present moment, because this redemption principle rests within the person in the relation between his mind and his soul. The individual who allows the mind to dominate his life is not going to change to any approximate degree. He may, a little, he may come to a little better understanding through constant misery, but it will be a long and difficult path. It is only when the soul itself, as a positive factor, is allowed to speak and claim and state its own purposes that we have a chance for a more or less rapid regeneration of our social order. Well, how do we do this then? Here we are working now with this stream of intelligence flowing down through the ages, moving through one stratum of culture after another and coming down now to the 20th century and getting very close to the 21st century. How are we going to change the policies that are now in force? We are perfectly well aware that we are on the verge of great difficulty. We are, on, we are aware of the fact that nearly every policy that we have founded upon selfishness has failed. We are also aware of the fact that every ulterior motive has led to disaster. 
we have also become perfectly aware of the fact that beneath the thin veneer of civilization, the self-centered person is perfectly willing to sacrifice the life, health, happiness, and security of other people. He is only interested in one thing, himself. Now, somewhere along the line of this also, there is still another factor, which the Romans called the fates. Fate is a mysterious legal mystery, nursed by the norms and by the various deities governing justice. And almost all ancient people have come to the conclusion that there is a justice, that this justice cannot be betrayed, that this justice is inherent, and that this justice is one of the reasons why we have red blood corpuscles, that this justice has made us capable of thought, that all that we have to survive, everything that is important to our continuance, is, is under the rulership of justice. That means that minor infractions will be punished and we will come back into the mainstream and go on. But that major mistakes intentionally made will produce major changes in the attitude of justice towards the future of peoples. On the grounds that uh, most of the ancients have now found to be reasonable from records and from the histories of knowledge from the beginning, there are certain rules that cannot succeed. These who prove rules are, are being broken constantly. And there are many ways in which we study them. There are also many people who believe that they can change any rule. On the simple grounds that you have money enough to buy the rule, you can do it. If you have enough power to control the rule, lawmaker, you can make bad laws. Yes, you can make them, but you cannot keep them. Every fallacy that we have in life is temporary. Every mistake condemns itself. If we stop it early in its way, it's merely an inconvenience. If we allow it to build a monstrosity of its own, then it becomes a great danger to our survival. So in the beginning of the present century, we have the recognition of the fact that wisdom going on and, and uh, with, to understanding will be able to address this problem. Understanding is a, a comprehension of the facts. Wisdom is an ability to recognize a fact and understanding is the ability to transform this recognition into a way of life, into a legal system, into a code, into a prevailing policy to advance the causes of permanence and good. We are now probably in about as bad a condition as we can hope to be. We are beginning to recognize that after all these years we are really outdoing the past when it comes to lawlessness. We have completely broken down the integrities. Now how did this happen? Was it something that had to happen? Well, it must have had to happen, or it wouldn't have, but at the same time there are some qualifying factors. There has been a gradual shift of purpose. The objective of life has changed. In the ancient times, and in the, up to uh, the present century, one of the principal objectives of life was to live well, or live as well as we could. We had a feeling also that there was a prospect a punishment after death which might help to keep us in order while we are here. Even without that, there was a certain recognition of basic values. And this recognition came from experience. Families, communities living together found out how to survive by mutual helpfulness. They found out how to destroy by mutual competition and discord. And little by little it became evident that there were the better things were the ones that would last and endure. This is true in entertainment, in art, music, literature, everything. But we are not, not, not watching this procedure. We are not keeping the truths with it. We are not fulfilling the, the evidences that these things have locked within themselves. We have determined to do what we please. And then after we've done it, we don't do what we please. But we find it is not pleasant. 
So we have gradually become totally disobedient because of the fact that we wanted to live our own lives. All people wanted to be free of responsibility. And when, when everyone is free, there is no society. Where everyone wants to do as they please, there is no possibility of cooperation for common good. Where everyone is anxious to have more than anyone else, we can never have honesty. So we have a, a problem of having betrayed the, the truths that are developing within the structure of soul life. The soul is being betrayed by the mind. It is being forced to compromise in order to survive, or at least to survive in the way that we want to survive. That is, with considerable luxury and a lot of freedom. But the problem is very definitely there, that the soul has got to be strengthened. Now, the greatest, probably the greatest experts on this particular matter were the Neoplatonists of Alexandria. They were the ones who really made the great study of the human soul and its attributes. They found out that the human soul was a proper structure of beauty, that it was harmonious in all its parts, that it was benevolent and constructive in all its functions, and that it lived and fulfilled its purposes for the glory of God and the infinite good of mankind. Therefore, the laws of the soul have got to become embodied in the sciences of physical government and leadership. We are going to have to gradually recognize that the great power of the soul lies in one factor which became the basis of Christianity, and that is that the great power of the soul is love. So that love becomes, I might say, the ultimate of intelligence. Love becomes the final expression of the mind. It becomes absolutely necessary to the advancement and protection of any structure built in society. There is no such a thing as a loveless perfection. There is no such a thing as a heaven filled with hate. All of these qualities must be brought and reconciled. And we find that most people are slow in reconciling these qualities. So we now come to another problem of importance. How are we going to educate people to save themselves? How are we going to find a way that these people can help to secure a more permanent way of life for all of us? There's no use taking the hope that le legislation is going to do it. Legislation can't do it because the legislators themselves do not have the insights. Education cannot do it as we know it today because it does not have the integrities. We go from one branch of learning to another and in every case something is missing. We cannot accomplish with the facilities now available. The only actual availability that we have is ourselves. And the only part of ourselves that can bring us out of the doldrums is the human soul. <clears throat> we can use the power that we possess to improve the world we live in. And while no one is going to be perfect at it, a reasonable improvement in a reasonable number of thoughtful persons can avoid a crisis which may otherwise be very difficult. We can start by overcoming in some measure too the mistakes that have not only given us our problems but are continually hurting us. It isn't that we're giving up something that is wonderful and fine and fortunate. We're giving up only something that has hurt us so badly we can hardly stand it. But for so, um, some reason or other we do not recognize a hurt when we suffer from it. We recognize only uh, that we do or do not do what we please. And uh, all the learning from the ancient times, from the primitive tribes of Africa to the most remote parts of Asia, we all have been told by the gods and sages that we are not here, here to do what we please. We are here to do what is necessary to fulfill the purpose of life. The great plan of life is beyond our touching. We cannot change the ages. We cannot change the motion of stars. We cannot do all these great wonders of the galaxies. And we can put all the crafts into orbit that we want to, but we will never be able to correct the ills of society 
by any conquest of atmosphere or space. We have to work directly with situations. It is true, of course, that if we work with the situations, we will correct most of the mistakes of science and economics which are giving us trouble. Actually, therefore, our big problem is that we've got to face the importance of personal integrity. There is a plan. It is available. It has been known for ages. A way of life that is acceptable to the universal plan. We must find this and use it. There is nothing else that we can do. And we must find how to apply it to various phases of our lives. We talk about getting the nations together. We read in the newspaper that somebody comes along and uh, assassinates another character and all the plans go to pieces again. This is part of a pattern of compound failure that is inevitable. The answer to the whole situation is that as it is in the case of a community, a country or a nation has to work together. It has to be one of a family of nations. And it has to live and act in accordance. And bring it right on down to the final unit of its application. Every family is a nation. Every family with the two or three children and the parents and the relatives is a commonwealth. And the laws of peace and harmony have to be established there. We cannot have a deluge of broken homes and corrupted morals in the family and a great, big, joyous, peaceful world. Nor can we put enough detectives and police on the families to straighten them out. Actually, all of these things have to be done from within. If we want to survive, we've got to live to survive. If we want to build something better out of this mess that we are now in, we've got to improve our own conduct and we've got to support every factor that is for the common good and stand resolutely against corruption and compromise. If we don't do these things, there's no way of solution. The moment we behave ourselves in these matters, we change the moral atmosphere. And the moral atmosphere is the air of the soul. The soul is straight. Where we do wrong, the soul is sick. The soul weeps for the corruptions of mankind. The deeper meaning of happiness, the security of a deep and peaceful existence. All these types of things are lost when we compromise the power of the soul in the affairs of mortals. The, the uh, spirit of man is too remote. The body is too indefinite and corruptible. The mind is too easily bribed and has too many ulterior motives. But the soul cannot be in any way damaged by these things. The soul that is corrupted is only corrupted in the sense that it is prevented from functioning. We are supposed at this time to be building soul. Each human being is supposed to be strengthening his own soul, giving more power to it, so that in the due time of things, that this soul will be like the golden wedding garment of St. Paul. And in the Bible, the soul is the garment of glory. It is that which proves conclusively the wisdom and integrity of the personal life. It is only when the individual uh, begins to work with this and works with it sincerely and consistently that we're going to get the results we want. Now, if anyone will try it for six months or a year, I don't think they'd ever give it up. It actually, they have to not start because no very few people would really like to continue having broken homes and yet they are being broken every day. They would do not believe sincerely that the broken family is a benefit to, to the unborn child or the infant. They do not believe that corrupted business is an addition to society. They all know the facts. But somewhere in each of these patterns there is a little some kind of personal selfishness. The individual would like to do what he wants to do and he's against the individual that tries to prevent him even if that individual happens to be right. So we have the problem every day 
of trying to work with these situations. But a person who would like to see a home that is not in constant turmoil, <coughs> who would like to see children grow up without becoming gangsters, can do this. There's no reason why the virtues of the soul, which is in itself higher than the mind, cannot control and direct the leadership of society. The, the world of society that is going to survive is surviving because it is built upon soul principle and soul power and, for, and is maintained by obedience to soul law. We've got to shift from our present pattern of following anything that offers a slightly larger salary to a situation in which the rulership of mankind moves to the next higher level of his own consciousness. And this may, may stepping up to the next higher level is the stepping up to, to understanding. It is the, is the step beyond the mind. It is the step beyond genius and beyond philosophy and beyond integrity as we practice it. It is the gradual realization that there is a one great pattern that all society must follow it. This is hinted at in Moore's Utopia and it is very well set forth in many other uh, novel works of thoughtful people who have tried to influence society. There is no doubt in the world that this problem we face could be solved without war, without contamination, without any serious loss of value to anyone if we would begin to live by the integrities rather than uh, the mistakes. Actually, every bankruptcy is a monument to an integrity that has been broken. Every time that we find people in grave trouble, they've done something that's wrong. Now, why would these people not prefer not to be in great trouble? Why would they prefer to go through a bad scandal or go through prison punishment because of a mistake that they never needed to make in the first place? To get rid of this personal determination to break the rules in order to satisfy the appetites just can't go on into the next generation. The next generation can start where all changes start, in the home. That is the Chinese concept. If the average American home begins to improve, if it's only a 5% improvement, a 10% improvement, we will have a much greater chance of going into the 21st century in one piece. And also, in doing this, and making these changes, we prepare a new generation to take over. At the present time, the generation that must take over when we go is in worse condition than we are. <laughs> the, the problem is that we cannot have people go on and carry the load unless those people have been exposed to integrities. If the young person growing up today is given the values that are necessary, he will help to build the future. But going as he does now, he is more apt to re want to have laws removed entirely so that he can do exactly as he pleased and destroy anything he doesn't like. We've got to a point where the integrities are gone. And this is not possible to a people who want to go on and build a better world. We have great need today of making the simple changes in our personal habits, the simple revisions of our integrities. We need to have greater moral codes of ethics. We may or may not need more theology, that is the question, but we certainly need some religion and need it badly. We need anything that will induce us to live straight and to do what is right. And that is what the burden was of the ancient times where the mysteries were established as sacred institutions. They were solid centers of integrity in changing worlds. With a solid background at some point, with a solid se section of our society dedicated to one purpose, we can allow the others to drift a little more and they will drift back into shape. But if we give them no example, if we give them nothing to build upon, if our public school system is as corrupt as our politics, what are we going to do? We are going to destroy the product of, of ages of growth. We are going to tear down what the soul has built over a period of ages. We are going to betray 
the whole course of civilization which has always had a few a few who have been lighted and given strength a few who many, many of that few have been martyred they have died for principles and we are dying for breaking principles and uh, this has to be a change in this particular point of view if we wish to go on so we will say that after co the coming of wisdom is the impetus given by the soul within the individual to take what we find to find, take the wisdom that we know and take it out of the books and the air and out of our own heads and put it to work in society wisdom is of no value if it is not used and, we, and when we get to the point where we will be willing to admit the obvious namely that they were happier and, and better with knowledge and wisdom than we are without it then we can do something but we cannot go on this way half the nations of the world are at war today or in various forms of uh, warlike maneuvers we have never had a time in which we've had more money and less ethics more power and less principle more uh, scope for progress and less progress therefore we've got to get together and do these things and they get to be uh, to win it must be a victory of soul power over brute power that was the dream of Gandhi and it must be the dream of all the soul within us the life within has to gain victory over the bad habits of the body and also over the conspiracies of the mind we may try to, do, to get by without making these corrections but we will not be able to we cannot go against common sense integrity honor and realities we cannot break universal laws or bend them to our purposes we are part of a very large structure that extends far beyond the dimensions of space as we know them the mystery of life goes on to inconceivable distances and qualities in every direction and one little planet is not going to be able to break all the rules of this great pattern with impunity we live in a universe of law of infinite benevolent law ever working for the common good of all and we cannot be an island of hate in an ocean of love we cannot be an island of fallacy in a, a great plan of consistencies and integrities so it becomes very important to us to realize now that uh, the wisdom the thinking that we have to do will have to be enlightened and that we have sources for it it is quite possible to build it it is not impossible but it will require a little thought a little dedication a little consecration to principles if we will keep these things and do them as we know they should be done we can have a pretty good time and each person in his own life can begin little ways to do it if the person has a, a sharp temper let's give a little work on that get it so it isn't quite so sharp if an individual knows they have a tendency to d disobey the rules of good uh, sportsmanship and make all decisions in favor of themselves it's time to find out if a marriage couple a married couple decide and realize that selfishness is separating them that they are not willing to work together they want to get, live off of each other but not with each other that these types of things are all detrimental if we will go to work with these little problems and make sure that every child has the best bringing up that we can give it that every people that we know in the world are given support for their integrities all these things will help and with just a small indication of this we will put the little green sprig out of the earth and show that we are trying what we are trying to do there has to be a new birth of truth a new birth of virtue a new birth of dedication a new birth of the realization that we are here for the purpose of growing and that growth can be a beautiful adventure if we cannot be, make a beautiful adventure if we pervert, destroy and corrupt it ourselves at every step of the way so to get our philosophy to work and we can do great things as needs arise thank you